BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia. Black Box Ned 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And welcome to BBOR, the home of True Crime Talk Radio and your premier destination for unsolved mysteries, criminal psychology, and exploring the dark side of cyberspace. My name is Ned DeHaan, and I am your host as well as the creator of Astro Psych 400 here on YouTube, and regular contributor to the Zodiac Killer channel. And a great way to support these shows is just by listening to some more content. But you can also go over to Amazon.com and have a look at the book Killer on a White Horse, written by me, Ned Dahan. It is a novel, murder mystery, inspired by the Zodiac Manson connection, but it is indeed fictional. However, who doesn't love a good mystery? And there is always the Teespring page. Feel free to check out some of the merchandise. And remember, being weird is not a crime. Let the show begin. This episode of Black Box Online Radio is brought to you by Rep Sports and Ray's Energy. Are you a fan of energy drinks, protein shakes, and health foods? Well, I sure am. I use the stuff almost every single day. They sell Ray's Energy products at my local gym, but you can have them shipped to your home. Use the coupon code NED075, that's N-E-D-075, for discounts applied at the checkout. The link is in the description box. Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to the show. Just a couple of quick announcements before we begin. The first is that on Friday, I will be doing the first episode in a multi-part series on the suspicious death of Diane Linkletter. She passed away on October 4th of 1969, and what happened to her is somewhat of a mystery. Some people believe that she simply committed suicide, and other people believe that she was indeed murdered by the Zodiac Killer, nonetheless. And if you're somebody who simply cannot get enough Zodiac Killer content, I will also be doing the Zodiac Killer debunking series on the weekend, where I talk about suspects whom I think absolutely were not the Zodiac Killer, or at the very least there is a low chance. Lots of things here on Black Box Online Radio, so feel free to like and subscribe to follow along with all of these true crime discussions. Over the past few weeks, I've been talking about the program Meet Mary Murder, and still trying to find out if they're going to be releasing a second season of the show, and I said that if they did, I would be following along with the episodes and doing some responses, and I wanted to give you guys a preview of what that might look like. And that's what this one is here. I'm going to be responding to Season 1, Episode 1 of Meet Mary Murder, hosted by Michelle Trachtenberg. And if you haven't watched that show and you're not familiar with the case that I'll be discussing, that's fine. And if anything, I think you should keep listening because you might get a better understanding or you would have the ability to have a fresh take on the subject. So please stay tuned. Today we are going back to 2017 to talk about the death of George Young. George Young was murdered in a plot that was co-orchestrated by his own wife, Tia, in Georgia. George was somebody who worked in the security business. On Meet Mary Murder, they said that he had three different jobs, but as I understand it, it seemed like these were three different assignments or three different contracts, or he was responsible for three different operations, but he worked in the security business. They also featured a photo of him with Shaquille O'Neal, and he actually looked rather short compared to Shaq, who's seven foot one. But George Young was six foot six himself. Now George was a very hardworking person. He was described as a very loyal provider, but he was also very compassionate and generous. And he brought somebody into his home named Tim Lee. Tim's name is actually Harvey, but he goes by his middle name Timothy, shortened as Tim. And George has these three jobs that he is working, so it becomes very difficult for him to keep up with some of the um, duties involving his wife, or just spending time with his wife, Tia, period. And there's this guy, Tim, in the house who's trying to get his life together, but what happens? They end up spending time together. They have an affair. And that's where Meet Mary Murder truly takes us. It's a show that wants to point out that the person in your life who is your partner might actually be 
the most likely person to to kill you, and statistically speaking, and that's what they want to zone in on. So that's one of the reasons why I wanted to use that as a show that I would follow along with. And the second reason is this show, I think, is very good for providing things like statistics, for providing analysis, interviews with psychologists. And it's hosted by Michelle Trachtenberg, and of course she is a celebrity, so to speak, but she also presents the stories in a very interesting way, one that I haven't heard before on a true crime program. She makes lots of facial expressions that are very odd, and it's my own interpretation of this, but I think that she does it in a borderline inappropriate way because it's meant to be unpredictable, because that's the whole point. You don't know what somebody is going to do next. Even if you think you understand what somebody is going to do, you don't know what they are truly planning or what they're thinking. And obviously, um, she's just trying to be entertaining. And I have that feeling that it's meant to be alluring. It's meant to be captivating. And she um, even says some things that really push the boundaries. I don't think anything on the show has ever been completely inappropriate. But it's almost even making light of the subjects at some time, at some points. For example... In the first episode, she says that while George is working, Tim and his wife Tia are working up a sweat because they're having an affair. Some odd sentences, but I mean, it gets your attention, and I think that it is, it's serving a particular purpose in the, as a storytelling mechanism. Now, what happens with George and Tia is that George has a $1 million insurance policy out on his, um, on his life, a life insurance policy, and this enters into what I call the Forensic Files murder, because back in 2019, I used to listen to lots of Forensic Files on the Forensic Files podcast, nonetheless, and it seemed like every other episode was about somebody murdering someone close to them for profit, usually life insurance. But other times it's like somebody murders his business partner because he wants to gain control of the business. It happens all the time. And usually, I repeat, usually, these crimes are very poorly planned. So George is just coming home one night. He puts his key in the lock and he is shot by someone. He is shot in the chest and once on a higher part of his body. And what happened? Well, The police are called, and something very odd happened from Tia. She said that she didn't want to approach his body because she was just too squeamish, and she didn't want to see him in case he were shot. But they just thought that was absolutely bizarre. They thought that was a weird thing to say. I know that you might not want to see someone who may possibly be dead, but that's just a very bizarre thing for someone to um, say in response to that, as well as... That's setting off the alarm bells immediately. The red flags are going up. And then, the day after George's murder, Tia makes a call inquiring about the $1 million life insurance policy. And it took the authorities a while to connect all the dots. And the story is actually that Tim fired the gunshots at George while he was putting his key in the lock and then ran around to the back door of the house and entered there. Not to interfere with the crime scene, so to speak. And it's also important to remember that even though George worked in security, they had security cameras at his house, surveillance cameras, but they were not operational, so they had no video of who committed the shooting. And it took months for the police to connect all the dots, at least five months before they were actually able to put everything together. And as I said, listening to a lot of forensic files... You would hear these stories of people who orchestrate murder plots, and they often make trouble for themselves. It's like they almost are just falling apart on purpose, because Tia is questioned about George's murder, and she starts adding in very obscure things, saying maybe he was murdered because of a gang initiation, Maybe he was murdered for some type of revenge killing. Providing these motives when she has no... She should, I repeat, she should have no idea what went on. And I know it's because 
the nature of the show, we know what's going to happen, right? It's called Meet Mary Murder. We in the audience already know that she's guilty because that's the nature of the show. However, just hearing those words as she is sharing that with the authorities, it sounds like she is trying to um, incriminate herself. She's just saying things that would be drawing unnecessary attention in her direction. And another thing that was brought up uh, from Michelle Trachtenberg, nonetheless, she talked about how she is a professional actress and she, Tia is putting on an act. And then the motive was not only the $1 million insurance policy, but also Tia, the wife and now widow, is getting off on the attention. She likes being interviewed. She has this desire to become the center of everything. And you just have to wonder about how much did that play in there? Because the show openly said, oh yeah, the, the motive for this was the $1 million life insurance policy. But they had a few lines in the episode that they really just kind of breezed past about her desire for attention. I mean, I introduced this segment the same way they introduced the show, saying, her husband, George, George Young, was a hardworking individual. He worked three jobs. He had these um, three assignments. He put a lot of effort into providing, as well as being supportive to people in his life like Tim Lee. And he did not maybe have enough time for his wife. So someone who felt attention-starved in that respect then went on to use his murder as a form of attention seeking and was just the desire to be noticed and to be heard like becoming overwhelming for somebody like Tia. And you also have to wonder why did she marry somebody who was not going to give her the type of attention that she wanted in the first place? Nothing against George Young. All he was trying to do was to be a successful provider, I mean to the best of my knowledge. But no matter what happened, no matter what he did, he did not deserve to be murdered simply because he was working long hours by a friend and by his wife who co-orchestrated this plot together. Absolutely not. But you just have to wonder in like the psychological mechanisms that is going on with her. And I don't even know if a therapist could figure this out for Tia Young about why she did what she did. But how is, she, how is she putting herself into all these situations when she isn't getting what she wants? Did her parents not spend time with her when she was a kid, and did, did, did she retaliate in destructive ways? I'd be very curious about those things, and I don't even know if she would remember the exact reasons that would drive her to do what she did. But with Tim and Tia, the two people who are in this murder plot together, they are giving different stories, are giving conflicting information because they're lying. And what liars tend to do is they can't always stick to the same story or I know that this is going to sound lousy, but you must have told a lie at some point in your life, right? I sure have. And sometimes you get confused about what you said to person A versus person B, or maybe you think that a more convincing explanation will get you off the hook. And the older we get, the less we tend to lie, I think. I mean, just compared to being a kid, remember the kid who has um the chocolate icing all over their face, or chocolate frosting, rather, and they're like, did you eat that piece of chocolate cake? No. Okay, I mean, stuff like that. And um, as we get older, we pay more attention to this through the concept of maturity. But when you get caught in a lie, sometimes you can tell a different story. Shakespeare's Macbeth is a very good illustration of this point about how when somebody does something bad, they have to do additional bad things to cover it up. They have to have additional wrongdoings so that the truth never comes out. And I think a lot of that was going on with Tim and Tia and this murder plot that they orchestrated. And I've shared this before on the channel, but one of my own original observations about people like Tia Young, who would be involved in this ridiculous plot about how somebody has shot her husband as he was putting his key in the door for no apparent motive, and he has a $1 million insurance policy, well, what what should they expect? I mean, what would the authorities be thinking? 
what really is the alternative? Is she just going to get up there and say, well, maybe it was a gang initiation? Yeah, right, while you're claiming your $1 million benefits? That's what I said, though, when I said I think some people want to get caught. And why do they want to get caught? Because they are living in a miserable life, and their their underlying structures of their thought processes are pushing them toward a way of getting out of that that life that they're living, even if it means going to jail. They're just going from a terrible situation in the free world to a terrible situation in the imprisoned world, most likely, but they just want out. They want to um, get out of the life that they're living in, even if it means that they're going to be imprisoned and incarcerated. And by the way, George and Tia had three children together, so absolutely saddening. And you really have to wonder about the um, selfishness and greed, how that is just overtaking somebody who has three children with this man, yet you want him murdered, and you want to have access to a new lover, but, you know, what about the kids that they had together? It's ridiculous, and it's ridiculous. And did she think that she was just going to get up there and talk her way out of it? Some people do, though, and they go into the category of they think that there's some type of master manipulator or master persuader, but the joke's on them because they fool absolutely no one. And that's what ultimately happened. The police were able to connect the dots, and both Tia and Tim were found guilty, and they were sentenced to life in prison, though. Tia is eligible for parole, and she will be um, el eligible for parole in, what was it, 2049, when she's in her 70s. And I think it's also important to note that I was reading up on an article that was published by AJC.org, um, and they said that she was not found guilty, like she was found not guilty, I should say, on aggravated murder, but all the other charges she was found guilty of, including a lower murder charge, they just didn't believe that she was guilty of aggravated murder. That I could agree with, because... It appears very clear now that Tim was the trigger man, but she was definitely an active participant in orchestrating the plot. However, just because someone does not pull a trigger, they should still be found guilty of a murder charge. There are different um, ways of finding people guilty for that. And one of the easiest ways to do that is second-degree murder. And if somebody is some type of active participant at all, and the events that lead up to a murder, then they are still found guilty, usually. And I can't help but think that the story of George Young is very reminiscent of what happened to Fred Lane, the football player. Fred Lane was also coming home. He put his key in the lock, and he was shot twice by his wife, Deidre Lane. She's featured in a lot of true crime programs, including Snapped Women Who Kill. I have an episode about here on Black Box Online Radio, one of the old-fashioned uh, Black Box recordings with the pink bubbles on it. However, there's a very big costly error in there, so I would like to invite you to listen to that if you want, but there is a big mistake. However, Fred Lane was a running back for the Carolina Panthers and just signed with the Indianapolis Colts, and he didn't have a $1 million insurance policy on him. He had a $5 million insurance policy. And then there's even, again, another ulterior motive. And it's possible that that wasn't even the only reason why Deidre Lane murdered him. Maybe she was uh, scared that he had information on her and her brother. Because Deidre Lane's brother was a criminal, he was a bank robber, and Fred Lane was an NFL athlete, and he simply did not want to cooperate with the scheme that was going on, saying, no, I want no part of that. So it was a two birds with one stone move on the part of Deidre Lane. But she was caught, and she was convicted, yet she was let out of prison. And the system can have giant holes in it. I mean, there can be walls around the prison, there can be all types of fences, but sometimes there are very large gateways where people can get in and out of jail. And I think that um, that is just a very um, unfortunate thing, but as of now, um, Tia Young is still in prison, and to be honest, I didn't believe that she should get um, the possibility of parole at all based on how uh, self-serving the crime was. Definitely not a crime of passion. De definitely something that was premeditated, calculated, orchestrated, just done very poorly. 
and it's saddening to um, think that people are doing this all the time. And here's another reason why I watch these types of shows, something like Meet Mary Murder, where somebody is going to these lanes to try and keep someone from getting out of the marriage. I mean, it's because they're real. It's because they do happen so frequently. It's because these are stories of true people. And again, there's this very um, nasty side of humanity that most people don't want to talk about, but I believe that it is necessary to explore. And I said that I would talk about some of the statistics in the show, and I actually found this website called Statista that shares that 80% of murder victims are actually men, and the um, show Meet Mary Murder wants to point out that this is a very clear case where a man is murdered by his wife. However, there are still overwhelmingly more women who are killed by their partners than men, and somebody once uh, wanted to uh, challenge me on that uh, 36, um, no sorry, 38 percent of women who are murdered are murdered by their partner. They said, no, it's much higher than that. And according to this Statista page, yes, that seems to be correct. 64% of uh, murder victims who are murdered by their partner or family member are women. 36% are men. And if it's only about partners as opposed to other family members, 82% of people who are murdered by their partner are women and 18% are men. And the honest answer is I believe that it's just going to be very difficult to get exact numbers on this, but I can I can see why, because it's just basic sociology. Men are going to be in more dangerous situations more often than not. 80% of murder victims are men, and in domestic violence situations, men are going to be the uh, aggressor, so to speak, but not always. There are many men who are going to be featured on the show Meet Mary Murder, who experienced life the exact same way that George Young did. And that's something that we all need to remember, is that there are different ways that crimes are planned, because the murder of George Young is very telling. Tia Young, his wife, and ex-wife now, was completely involved with the process. She is completely an active participant. However, she is not the trigger man. And this happens so frequently that a woman is not going to commit the murder herself, but she's going to manipulate another man into doing so. I frequently bring up the example of Gypsy Rose Blanchard, who manipulated her boyfriend, Nick Godijan, into committing the murder of her mother, Dee Dee Blanchard, and she's not going to get life in prison without the possibility of parole. She's going to be out in several years, but he did. He got life without the possibility of parole, maybe for better or for worse, and you can debate that in the comments section down below. But I think what's much more important is to note that people do things in different ways. People commit crimes in different ways, and there definitely seems to be some correlation about how men are going to be, um, as, as I said, the majority of murder victims are men. Women are more likely to be murdered by their partners, and even more likely to be murdered by family members. And it's saddening, though. And it's saddening just to think that humanity wants to do this to, to each other. Like, say, for example, the murder of George Young. What's the motive? Money? Attention? Selfishness? And I think, um, blamelessness. When someone thinks that they will not be blamed for their actions, they're just going to progressively do more and more heinous behaviors. And I was talking about this even on some of the Zodiac Killer episodes when I was saying that there was um, just a very high um, problem with the hierarchy of values. And I learned a lot about this from Soren Korsgaard, author of America's Jack the Ripper when he said that it's not just that someone has a psychological issue or what I was saying about bad experiences in the childhood with Tia Young, I'm speculating. I would, I would, well, what I said was, I don't really know if there is or there isn't. Maybe there is, 
I mean, that's to be very clear. That was my assessment of her. I've never met the woman. I've never interviewed her. All I know about her is from what I've read on the internet and looked at some uh, pie charts and donut graphs, as well as watching the show Meet Mary Murder. But what Soren really wanted to convey to me is that someone has realigned their hierarchy of values when they think that if they will not be blamed for the crime, they're going to commit a murder. And that's bad. Absolutely, that's bad. That's completely inappropriate. Um, not only inappropriate, immoral, unethical, wrong. It's just, um, but these things do happen. However, I would just like to ask you guys, um, what true crime programs do you like to follow? I mean, like the ones that are on television. And as I said, though, I might do a future series responding to Meet Mary Murder and um, some of the, discuss some of the other factoids that they want to share on their TV show. But um, I was definitely tempted to review Vengeance Killer Newlyweds, which is available on HLN. It's definitely packaged as a type of very glossy show. I mean, like, they really hype it up so much on HLN. So I have um, some 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 doubts but when i've actually watched the show vengeance killer newlyweds i've seen that they talk about stories that are quite different than meet mary murder it's not only about how someone can be murdered by their partner it's also about how a husband and wife can cover up for each other how about that one and the victim can be somebody who is not one of the partners in the marriage. And then it's a completely different psychological dynamic. And then there are um, perhaps some of the more classic shows out there, Forensic Files, 48 Hours, Dateline. That was another one that I thought of. And maybe that was actually the uh, first time that um, I thought about following a show regularly and doing these types of podcast responses because they on, the, on one of the local West Virginia channels, they hear Dateline very frequently and they talk about all kinds of true crime cases, and I have definitely contemplated that. But what are some of the um, true crime shows that you like to watch, or maybe some other even podcasts that you like to listen to? You can put your ideas in the comments section down below. Oh, and before I forget, the Reels channel, R-E-E-L-Z, has a lot of, um, uh, I'd say... Um, just true crime material in all sorts of directions. Also, I recommend I Survived from A&E. Many out there, but I want to hear from you. That really is the only challenge question for the day. What are some true crime programs that you like to watch? All right, well, that's all for me now, and uh, please look out for some future true crime discussions here on this channel. Thank you so much for listening. As always, you can like and subscribe. And uh, the book is Killer on a White Horse by me, Ned DeHaan, on Amazon. There's the Teespring page, Rep Sports and Raise Energy, lots of things in the description box. Anybody can write the show at blackboxonlineradio at AWOL.com. You can also get me on Instagram at blackboxned88. And I will see you over there for the bonus podcast. Until next time.